السلام عليكم and welcome to part 5 which is the part 2 of the story so the members of the family were exempt and once Allah exempted them directly the males of the family started visiting the wives of the messenger and things started returning gradually and then Allah Ta'ala who knows how flirtatious the wives of the messenger were and the prophets already were and all the culprits that they were in Allah addresses the wives directly now because Allah has taken care of the predators now he turns to the wives he tells them what Allah so do be aware of Allah fear him take him into your consideration and calculations for Allah indeed knows all things is presently witness in Allah can ala kulli shay'in shahida so why is Allah being very strict on the prophet's wives well it's because of their behavior when outside and when interacting with man they encourage the sexual predators behavior towards them and that is why Allah is telling them to be very aware of himself and that no matter where they are and no matter what they are doing he is there with them and is witness then Allah Ta'ala turns now see he stopped the predators no more predators in the home and then people distance themselves from the Prophet then Allah even the family the close family of the wives ran away then Allah brought the close members the male members of the family back then Allah turns to the wives of the Prophet instructing them to watch themselves then Allah turns to the entire Muslim community at the time and he addresses them he didn't tell them oh you who believe go back and talk to Muhammad he didn't do that what Allah did was something extremely, extremely powerful because Allah teaches us to lead, you have to lead by example, not just by instructions. And that's why He tells them, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu. Indeed, Allah and His angels, Yusalluna ala nabi. Do their salat on the, I will explain all this. Do their salat on the Prophet you who have believed do the same thing as I and my angels do unto the Prophet do your salat to him and do the, your taslim to him again to refresh your memory they always translate this extremely important solution to this whole problem they say surely Allah and his angels bless the Prophet so you who have believed bless and greet him with peace indeed Allah and his angels give blessings indeed and I've already spoken about this but that is not what Allah is saying these translations and before them the sheikhs and the scholars and all these people who could never ever agree on what Allah meant in this ayah were doing so because they settled on saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when asked about this ayah they don't know what the meaning is believe me they have no and that's why there is a difference of opinions about the meaning of this sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of course all this is nonsense really nonsense because Allah did not ask people to say something to about Muhammad to Muhammad Allah says that him and his angels do something they are doing something and Allah instructs the believers at that time to do something to Muhammad not say you see the way things have been cooked is this way Allah and his angels do their salat on the Prophet okay when people say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what they are saying is this I will translate it literally they say Allah has done his salat on the Prophet let's say why are you telling me this? Allah has said in the Quran that he does it. Why do you keep saying that Allah has done his salat on the Prophet? Why don't we say Allah and the angels since Allah said Allah and the angels. Why don't we say Allah and the angels do their salat on the Prophet? Why do we always say Allah did his salat on the Prophet? This is the meaning of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah did the salat on the Prophet and he made the taslim on him. And this is a lie. It really is Allah. 
anyone who believes that when they say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or peace and blessings be upon him or all these nonsense sentences if they believe they're gonna get a reward on this they will be surprised on judgment day because on judgment day when Allah asks them why do you keep saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after Muhammad I didn't say it in the Quran I didn't order you to say it where did you get it from uh, 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 hadith what hadith what hadith I ordered you to follow the Quran and the Quran alone. Did I order you to follow the Hadith? And believe me, 99.99, .99, and you can draw as many nines as you wish after the point, they will be surprised on Judgment Day. All this because they left the Quran. And the first thing, the first shock that's going to happen to them on Judgment Day is as soon before, before, and I will say it, before accountability, before we start passing one after one after one after one in front of Allah. When nations are all gathered and before in front of each nation there is a prophet and the book that Allah sent to that nation. And believe me, each nation has got their own uh, prophet, everybody. But you know, we the believers, those who believe in Muhammad and the Quran, we all be gathered in bunch. In, in, group and who's gonna stand in front of us the leader is gonna be Muhammad but you know what he's gonna do he's gonna hold the Quran in one hand and he will point to the Muslim believers entirely and he will say ya Allah my people have taken this the Quran that he holds and they ignored it deliberately ignored it that's the only time the Prophet will speak and he will witness against every single Muslim that has not followed the Quran. Once he makes that testimony, everybody on Judgment Day would realize that what they followed about Hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, the school of thought this, the school of thought that, is actually nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. And then they get stuck because the, the Prophet has witnessed against them that they abandoned the Quran. So now, what does Allah mean that him and his angels have done their salat on the Prophet? The strange thing really that makes you bang your head against the wall is that this action of Allah and the angels doing their salat on the Prophet is not something special for the Prophet. <laughs> it's not something special for the Prophet. Allah didn't do that for the Prophet alone. No, 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 no. Guess what? He did it for us as well. In the same Surah 33, in the same Surah 33, in the same Surah, few ayat before, really not many, Allah says this, هو الذي يصلي عليكم وملائكته. It is Allah and His angels. He says it is Allah who does His salat upon you, the believers, and so do His angels. <laughs> Allah does His salat on us, and the angels also do their salat on us. And then Allah explains to us how he does his salat and how do the how the angels do their salat. He says, to take you out of the darknesses into the light of the Quran. And here we understand what Allah meant and means when he makes his salat upon us. Allah salat upon us is to guide whoever wants to be guided and takes and works for guidance Allah shall take that person from the darkness to the light we sin we are in darkness we repent Allah takes us out from the sins into the light we are not following the Quran we follow Bukhari Muslim how do you think like that and then we realize we're wrong Allah takes us from the darknesses of what the humans have invented in Allah's religion to the light of the Quran. And why does he do that in the first place? Well, guess what? Because Allah watches in real time what humans are doing. And because of this, his constant watch, he knows who wrongs and who is doing bad and things like that. And that makes him take special care of those who are seeking the light of guidance. 
So Allah making salat on Muhammad is nothing special. <laughs> nothing special. Nothing special because he does it on us as well. How do the angels do their salat upon us? Simple. Allah has explained it many times. And I will give an example or two. Allah Ta'ala says, إِذْ تَقُولُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He speaks to his prophet, he tells him, And when you said to the believers in one of the battles, and they were overnumbered in Badr, there were so many people, and the believers were a minority, then the prophet, to help them boost their courage and motivate them, he tells them, أَلَمْ يَكْفِيَكُمْ Isn't it sufficient for you? Isn't it enough for you? That your Lord and you meet Rabbukum, that your Lord should supply you with 3,000 of the angels descended. And this is in Ali Imran Surah 3, the Ayah 124. So the angels supporting the believers in fights, in daily life, and things like that, that's how they pray on us. That's how they keep contact on us. You and me and every single human out there has got at least with them, at least with them, six angels. They don't quit you a single second. You have one in front of you, one behind you, one to your right, one to your left, and those who will write down your actions. These are six. And then if you are a good person and you do good and you are in good relation with Allah, Allah increases the number. And then it becomes extremely difficult for you to sin because you are protected. You are surrounded by the angel's light. That's why. So the angels, that's how they do their salat on us. Another one, when Allah Ta'ala sent the angels, for example, to help Lot. When they went to Lot and they told him, Ya Lot, we are messengers from your Lord. The people shall never reach you. That's, that's how the angels do their salat. You can find this in Surah Hud, that the Surah number 11, the Ayah 81. Another way on how the angels do their salat on us is what Allah says in the Quran. يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا They seek and they ask Allah for forgiveness for those who believe. And they say, this Allah even tells us how the angels do their salat on us, how they, they keep good contact with us, is they ask Allah, Allah to forgive us, he even tells us what they say. They say, رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا Our Lord, you encompass all things with your mercy and knowledge. So forgive those who repent and follow your way and shield them from the torment of the blazing fire. This is Surah Ghafir 40 and the Ayah 7. That's how the angels keep its actions. It's not, it's, it's, it, Angels do actions for us. Allah does actions. Doing the salat is doing an act. Is you behave towards somebody. How does Allah behave towards Muhammad? Simple. Look in the entire Quran what Allah has done for the Prophet. Forgiving him his sins of the past and the future. Protecting him, supporting him, helping him, feeding him. Everything. That is how Allah takes care of Muhammad. When Allah says Allah and his angels do their salat, it's saying Allah and his angels take care of Muhammad. That's what the salat means there. In Arabic, the term salat means relationship. If I am walking down the street and I find a friend with a little kid, I'm going to ask him, Oh, ma silatuka bihada? What's the sila between you and him? What's the relationship between you and him? As salat is a, the word salat is the relationship. That's what it is. It's what it is. So when Allah says that Allah and the angels do their salat, i.e. Allah and the angels have a relationship with the Prophet. And then he turns to the believers and asks them to build a relationship with the Prophet after the whole city distanced itself from the Prophet. That's what it means. It never was about Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah, for example, takes care of the Prophet and does his salat when he asks the believers, commands them that not to raise their voices over the voice of the Prophet. Not to talk to the Prophet as they would talk to each other. Don't call the Prophet as you would call yourself. Don't enter his house. Oh, and the ayat are extreme. <laughs> there are so many ayat. If, I, if I'm going to start telling you what Allah, how Allah takes care of the Prophet, I'll be spending here hours upon hours upon hours. 
Why? Because what Allah asked us is to do an act. The Salat on the Prophet was a deed, not some verbal sentence to say after his name. And I pray to Allah that by now it has become clear that what Allah was ordering the inhabitants of Al Madinah, the believers of them, was to keep in touch and reach out to the Prophet just like Allah and the angels do with. Not to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not to say Alayhi Salam, not to praise the Prophet and then they go out there and they lie and they cheat. This man made sentence was devised in the 3rd century and because in the 3rd century when they wrote the Islam that we have today when they designed the Islam that we have today it was easy for them to lie a man comes 300 years later and starts writing the fiqh, the jurisprudence starts writing the hadith and in the hadith he will tell the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and then they invent hadith that lie people would think that it's part of Islam but it is not. It really is not. There is no such thing as Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What Allah orders the believers was to do an act. And when he said, وَسَلِّمُوا عَلَيْهِ تَسْلِيمًا He tells them, and when you find him, you meet him, greet him. And greet him wholeheartedly. That's all there is to it. If I have now to translate the ayah as it should, it would read something like this. Indeed, Allah and the angels reach out to the Prophet. All you who believe, reach out to him and obey him and greet him and obey him and take care of him as you should. That's it. See that? It never was about this sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, of course, the story goes on that Allah Ta'ala, some people still kept talking and things like that. And then Allah Ta'ala jumps in to another issue and he says, Allah After Allah has taken care of the sexual perverts, after Allah saw how people reacted with what happened and that the entire Medina abandoned the messenger, Allah orders the male members of the wives to get back in action. Then Allah encouraged the whole city, at least the believers, to go and reach out to the messenger and have a good relationship with him. Then Allah warns the rest of the people that were not subscribing to what Allah says. And then Allah takes the issue personal. He said, Certainly those who offend Allah and his messenger, not the prophet. Now he's not talking about the human being, Muhammad the human being. He's talking about Muhammad the messenger. He's talking about Allah and Islam. He says those who offend Allah and his messenger when he was alive, but now he's dead. It means those who offend Allah and his Quran, the religion of Allah. Allah has cursed them in this life and in the hereafter and has prepared for them a humiliating punishment. All right? So how could someone offend Allah? Does Allah get offended? Of course, Allah doesn't get offended. But when you do something to offend someone that he said you should reach out to him, you actually are being rude to Allah. You try your best to offend Allah and that will reflect on the religion of Allah. What did the, those sexual perverts do after Allah issued this ayat? And the, the life started getting back. The Prophet now has the entire Medina. They're reaching out to him. They have learned from Allah how to reach out to him by being good to him. And how the angels reach out to Muhammad by being supportive and doing all kinds of stuff. They started going back to the Prophet, the good people of them, the minority of course, they start going back to the Prophet, reaching out, taking care of him, when he says something they obey, they do not object, and they are greeting, and it's all good and manshi is manshi, it's very nice. However, of those there were still others that sought not only to hurt the messenger, but to hurt everybody that was around the messenger, those who were now playing ball, so to speak.
Allah speaks to those and he says وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ As for those who afflict the believing men and believing women, they cause some problems and deeds of evil. And claim that, the, and of course, throw rumors against these. They accuse them of doing things that they haven't done. Allah said, and they afflict the believing men and women with deeds they did not earn. And then Allah Ta'ala says, these people, i.e. those, the, the false rumor people, they have surely burdened themselves with perjury and evident sin. And of course, a lot of, now that you understand and the story behind this Allah and his angels do their salat, i.e. reach out to the messenger and then Allah orders the believer to reach out to the uh, Prophet. If I had to say, I would say the Prophet whom Allah and the angels have reached out, but nothing special about that because Allah reaches out to us as well. And the angels reach out to us as well. So nothing special about Muhammad. And the same thing for the, the believers, they reached out to the Prophet and they took care of him and then they became more obedient and they listened, blah, blah, blah. So that is the whole concept. I want to close this talk with um, this closing thought, so to speak. As you can see, the Ayah 56 of Surat Al-Ahzab, in which Allah states that him and the angels do their salat, i.e. reached out to the Prophet, and that we should, uh, i.e. the people that were before who lived with the Messenger, they also should have or should reach out the Prophet. How we behave today, that ayah was not intended for us who do not see the Prophet, who is not alive with us. We cannot reach out to him, we cannot be kind to him, we can do nothing. Yes, we can speak good about him, we can make dua, we can do whatever we do. But that's just about that. But the problem is, as usual, most scholars, sheikhs, school of thoughts and hadith and all these men of religion don't use their brains and think for themselves. They just blindly follow whatever they learned and whatever was taught to them, whatever they were brainwashed with. And the huge majority of these sheikhs work for the government. And if they do not follow the Ministry of Religious Affairs and what the ministry believes in, they get fired and no more paycheck. And that is a big problem for the sheikhs. You see, being a sheikh these days is a job just like any other job. The sheikh, the sheikhs, the scholars, anyone are people who work to make a living just like you and me. A doctor goes to the hospital to work, the sheikh goes to the masjid to work. The only difference between the two is that the doctor goes to the hospital to make people's lives better, while the sheikh in the masjid makes our lives miserable. Everything is haram. Doomsday is upon us. No matter what we do, Allah is angry with us. The sheikh tell us not to love life, right? You should, you should live in this life as if you are a traveler because you're going to die tomorrow, right? And live in it as a stranger not to indulge in its luxuries and people don't listen to the sheikhs anymore because they realize that the sheikh is telling them not to love life and not to run after money and things like that but the sheikh himself does that he works and he, when you go inside his home is nice and beautiful so the salat of Allah that he wanted from the believers is as good as his own salat be courteous to him because Allah is courteous to the messenger, the prophet. Help him get those sex offenders off his back as Allah did. Be protective of him as Allah protects him. Look after his household and be respectful to them as Allah does. Address him politely and the list goes on. It never was about a sentence to be spoken sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What am I doing? Nothing. The man is dead. The man has had his sins forgiven of before and after. The man has been granted paradise already. The man is safe on judgment today. The man is bones inside the earth. Why should I keep telling people it is Allah who's made his salat? The reason they did this, my dear sisters and my brothers, is because on the third century, when different cultures came to, to Baghdad, which was the capital, and Al-Ma'mun, one of the kings of that time, started giving gifts. Anyone who translates a book from foreign languages, 
Romans, Persians, and Byzantines, and all Greeks, and things like that, he will give him its weight in gold. And people start translating and things like that. In the third century, the scholars, the Muslim scholars, found themselves in a predicament and big problems. Now they got, for the first time in history, the Muslims are mingling with other super old powers and cultures. People that have a huge culture, they have big sciences. Like you go to Romans and Greeks and you have all these philosophers, mathematicians and things like that. What did the sheikhs do? They found themselves with the Jews and the Jews, they value Musa and they speak of him highly. The, the Christians, they put Jesus in the place of son of God. And people, each one, the, the Persians, they praise their God and things like that. So what did our sheikhs do? They started boosting on the other people. So whenever they mention the name of Muhammad or the Prophet and Messengers, they tell people, Oh, Muhammad is him upon whom Allah has done his salat. And people go, Wow. That's it. It's a lie. Everything is a lie. It's just boosting. It's just showing off. Our Muhammad is better than Jesus. Is better than Musa. Is better than that. Is better than that. Even though Allah in the Quran tells us, to equal all messengers and prophets, all of them are the same in the sight of Allah. But then again, who does listen to Allah? Ain't nobody these days, you tell them Allah says, they don't listen. So I pray to Allah now that you have a good understanding about this and the real significance of this ayah. So if someone gives you a headache, if someone argues, if someone does that, just give them my talk. Listen to the whole talk, to these five parts. It took me hours and I'm getting a headache. And it took me really over six weeks to prepare this, what I told you now, the researches I made and everything. Why? Because it's vital. It's our religion. On Judgment Day, when we stand in front of Allah, we do not want any surprises. And all surprises will happen that they are not in the Quran. Anything. On judgment today, Allah will ask you, my sister, why didn't you pray? Why did you take a whole week every month? What are you going to tell him? You said this in the Quran. It doesn't exist in the Quran. It's just blood coming out of you. What? Why don't you pray? Why? People have a toothache and it kills them and they still pray. But why not you? Why don't you fast? What are you going to say to Allah? You said this in the Quran. He's going to tell you, come on, that's the Quran. Show me and you won't find it. The reason you don't pray when you have your message, the reason you don't pray when you don't fast when you have your message is because humans told you so and they took it from Judaism. You come on judgment day expecting great rewards about your hijab? Allah ain't gonna give you one. Because you say, Allah, I covered myself. He goes, Where well, did I say you should cover yourself? And you're not gonna find it in the Quran. Really, you won't find it in the Quran. Ah, what, what can I say? I pray to Allah this has opened your eyes and I pray to Allah to bless you and make you the best of who you can be. Please stick to the Quran. You are on the safe side. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam uh, Ben Daud. That's my surname and uh, known in the community as Abu Hanifa. And if you need uh, to join my groups, please do send me a message either on YouTube or on WhatsApp. And uh, my number is 78 8735 and I'll be more than happy to add you to the group. We have a group for men and a group for ladies. And this is one <laughs> more. Uh, it makes me laugh. Why do we separate men from women? Why don't we trust each other and have one group? No, I don't want to be with men. All right. Yet you find Muslims who, uh, who join other WhatsApp groups or other groups, for example, uh, book groups or any other. But they are with men and women. It's normal for them. But when it comes to Muslims, no. I want to be by my, my, but anyhow, that's a story for another day. All right, yalla, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.